Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, this morning, we received a question uh, regarding the pathways information that was uh, provided to you. There was a question uh, regarding NASA's minority profile. And what I'd like to do right now before we go to our next session and our closing is give a member of my staff, Dr. Re Rebecca Krause, an opportunity to come forward and share that information with you. In the interest of transparency, we'd like you to know where we stand. So Rebecca, if you could come up. Thank you, Brenda. Good afternoon, everyone. So after this morning's conversation, I um, quickly pulled out some numbers. These are data from um, the most recent pay period. So it's um, from July 23rd. And um, so it's looking at the interns that were on board and on duty that pay period. Among um, the interns, 11% were Asian American or Pacific Islander. 6% were black or African American. 17% were Hispanic. 1% were American Indian or American Native, Alaskan Native, I apologize. 65% were white, 73% were male, and 27% were female. And that's out of 406 uh, Pathways interns. Um, we were talking about moving the needle, needle forward a little bit. So the percentage of Asian American Pacific Islanders in the intern population is a little bit higher than it is in the total NASA workforce where in the total NASA workforce for science and engineering, and these are also science and engineering interns, um, they represent, Asian American Pacific Islanders represent 9% of the NASA workforce. Um, but for Hispanics, they represent 7% of the NASA s &E workforce, and they were 17% of the interns. Um, for women, there's also a slightly higher percentage in the intern population versus the workforce population. Women account for 27% of the s &E interns this summer, compared to 23% of the NASA s &E workforce. So is there any questions on our, on, on our numbers? Yes. Hi, I'm Amy Smith from West Virginia State University. Um, my question is, are the percentages of men versus women in the internship program indicative of the percentages of those genders that apply? <coughs> Do you see the same amount? I mean, are 73% of the applicants male? That's a good question, and I don't have those numbers in front of me right now, but that is something we can look into. Thank you for asking. Any other questions? If you think of any, you can always email us at our um, HQ civil rights info at, info at nasa.gov. So thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, we're now going to move into our, our last um, session before the closing. And uh, the title of this session is Advancing Diversity Through Civil Rights Compliance. And uh, please be aware that we are looking to include all of our grantees, not just our colleges and universities, but our science centers and our planetariums, et cetera. And so uh, this afternoon, you're gonna hear information about all of our grantees. So you may ask, well, what exactly is civil rights compliance? And what does it have to do with advancing diversity and inclusion? The term compliance is certainly a very bureaucratic, legalistic sounding term. And as a lawyer myself, I am well aware of that. But civil rights compliance is not just some abstract legal concept or a bureaucratic game of gotcha to every entity receiving federal dollars. Civil rights compliance is an activity or a set of activities that has a very real world practical meaning. It is about coming up with strategies or solutions, if you will, 
to ensure that everyone is afforded equal opportunities. Or in other words, to make sure that everyone gets to participate, regardless of the color of their skin or their gender or whether they have a disability or any other characteristic protected as a matter of civil rights. So how does civil rights compliance correlate with efforts to advance diversity and inclusion? Well, that's what we're going, you're going to hear about this afternoon from our distinguished panel. They are going to share with you the specific activities and strategies that they are engaging in to ensure that everyone is included, that everyone has access to participate, whether we are talking about a university STEM program or a science center or museum. So I would like to introduce to you at this time David Chambers of my staff, who is the Acting Director of the Program Planning and Evaluation Division, and it has been instrumental in our compliance program over the years, and he will in turn introduce his distinguished panel. So David, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Brenda. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, all of our panelists have said that they wanted to stand before the podium during their remarks, so I've decided to follow suit. So we would be slightly different in that regard. Um, as Brenda said, the term compliance is, is a very dry and legalistic term, and uh, maybe because of that we have uh, switched up our presentations. You're going to be seeing not only slides from our panelists, but videos as well. So we have a real multimedia extravaganza for you to hopefully keep you awake during this last session. Uh, I'm just going to speak for a few moments before introducing our panelists. I hope I won't bore you too much, but I, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about how our panelists are going to relate compliance and inclusion. And I, and I wanted to clear up a few misconceptions or perhaps lack of information. Um, one of the questions we've, we've heard, you know, well, what does NASA have to do with civil rights compliance? I thought you were the space agency. Well, indeed, we are the space agency. Um, uh, the civil rights laws in the United States that pertain to programs receiving federal dollars are predicated on the notion that if Congress uh, is giving out money or the United States government is giving out money, then it gets to to say what you can and can't do with that money. And one of the things you can't do with that money is discriminate on the bases that we've talked about, race, gender, disability, and others. So again, what does NASA have to do with that? Well, the way that the regulations work is that every single agency that gives out federal dollars has to administer its own regulations. So NASA has regulations under Title IX, that law that you've all been hearing a lot about. Uh, we have regulations under that law. And another law, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits race discrimination. Very important law, another law under which we do compliance activities, as well as the Rehabilitation Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, which brings me to a, a little bit more of a specific point that I wanted to make. It kind of ties in with how we're we're going to show you that inclusion and diversity really do relate closely to compliance. Our laws don't talk about inclusion. They talk about uh, non-discrimination, and they talk about equal opportunity. I think our deputy administrator said it best the other day when she said, if you're engaging in something like harassment, you are in fact denying equal opportunity. And that's really how this all relates. We're about providing equal opportunities, and inherent in equal opportunity is inclusion and diversity. So there are specific actions that you can take to be in compliance. And when you take those actions, you are in all likelihood advancing inclusion and diversity as well. Take, for example, the classic example of uh, ramps outside of buildings, which weren't required until the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now, it wasn't the intention of us as American society to discriminate against people with disabilities by not having those ramps, but that's exactly what we were doing. And so the answer wasn't to you know, make anybody legally liable, it was just to say, change that. And so the law changed to now say this is a requirement. And that's the kinds of things that we'll be talking about. What are the specific actions that you as grantees can take to address compliance and at the same time advance inclusion? So I'd like to introduce you to our distinguished panel. We'll hear first from Rachel Gettler, who is an attorney with the U.S. Department of Education Office for Civil Rights. She primarily works on policy issues related to Title IX. Uh, which prohibits sex discrimination. Uh, these include sexual harassment and sexual violence, pregnant and 
parenting students and providing opportunities for women and girls in math and science. Uh, Rachel earned her law degree from the University of Southern California in 2006, and she graduated from the University of California, San Diego, where she studied poli-sci. Dr. Laurel Espinoza serves as the Assistant Vice President for the American Council on Education Center for Policy, Research, and Strategy, where she is responsible for the co-development and management of the center's research agenda, focusing on issues of diversity and equity in 21st century higher education, public finance and higher education systems, and transformational leadership. Espinosa holds an associate's uh, degree from the Santa Barbara City College, a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of California, San Diego, and a master's degree and PhD in higher education and organizational change from the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Christine Reach, who comes to us from the Boston Museum of Science, is the Vice President of Exhibits Development and Conservation at the Museum of Science, one of the world's largest science centers and a recipient of NASA grants, which oversees a department that conducts research and evaluation studies related to various aspects of the museum experience. I said which, but I meant to say she. Uh, Christine um, does that overseeing. Um, Dr. Joni Baker is the Director of Equal Opportunity and Diversity for the Texas A&M University System, a consortium of 11 universities and seven, seven state agencies. She is on the advisory board of the Association of Title IX Coordinators. Dr. Baker has traveled to more than 70 countries and speaks Swahili, Mandarin, Chinese, French, and Spanish. She has a BS with a double major in poli science and urban affairs from American University and a master's in government from Georgetown University, as well as a PhD in natural resources development from Texas A&M University. You'll have to forgive me, I've made my mouth dry, so I'm going to probably have to drink some water. But um, so I would like you all to uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to our panel. And our first panelist will be Rachel Gettler. Hi, everyone, thanks, and hopefully, I can get this to work. Oh, I pushed the wrong thing, sorry. There we go. <laughs> they just told us what to do. <laughs> OK, so as David said, um, I'm an attorney in the Office for Civil Rights at the Department of Education. I'm actually in the policy group, and I do primarily work on Title IX. However, my presentation is going to cover Title VI um, and Section 504 as well. I did coordinate with my colleagues back in the office um, to get their views on what aspects of those laws I should highlight for you all. But I am. I do have much more expertise in the Title IX area, so keep that in mind if you have questions after. Um, and I work on the policy side. We also have enforcement side um, that does compliance reviews, complaint investigations. So you may have come into contact with folks from those 12 regional offices located across the country. So in this brief presentation, I just want to highlight um, the basics about how some of the various civil rights laws relate to STEM. I'm going to highlight admissions, recruitment, outreach, retention, and some additional things to keep in mind when you're talking about students with disabilities. And then the last slide of the, pre the, last slides of the presentation provides links to resources that are available on OCR's website, as well as information about how to contact um, the office if you uh, need additional technical assistance. So like David mentioned, and I think you've heard this throughout um, the, your time here, the laws that I'm going to focus on are the laws that are enforced by OCR. We enforce the laws um, among all agencies that receive federal financial assist, sorry, all institutions that receive federal financial assistance from the Department of Education. So basically at the K-12 level, that's all public elementary and secondary schools at the higher ed level, virtually all public and private. Um, institutions of higher education. So when I use the term school throughout this presentation, I'm really focusing on um, institutions of higher education because this is the, that audience, but it would also be applicable to um, museums and other kinds of um, science centers that have educational programs or activities. They would also be covered by um, our laws generally OCR is not the, the education is not the agency that does that enforcement work. It would be NASA or some of the other science agencies that directly fund those programs. But our regulations are very similar. Also, I use the term race throughout the presentation. I use that term as the blanket term to cover race, color, and national origin. All those are prohibited under Title IX, or sorry, under Title VI. 
So first, there's some key things to keep in mind when we're talking about admissions and eligibility criteria. You can't deny admission to students on the basis of race, sex, or disability. You can't condition the admission of students with disabilities on them agreeing to forego um, aids and services that they're entitled to. And you also can't use eligibility criteria that have an unjustified disparate impact on race, sex, or disability. So generally, if criteria do have a disproportionate effect on race, sex, or disability, um, the school must show that those criteria validly predict success in the education program or activity and that there's no alternative test or criteria that don't have that disproportionate effect um, available for them to use. Um, one of the caveats here to keep in mind for admissions in Title IX specifically, and just Title IX, is that the Title IX admissions regulations only apply to public coeducational undergraduate institutions and then they apply to public and private institutions of professional graduate and um, career and technical education. So they don't apply to private, at the private undergraduate level. That's just, that was in the statute and that's in the regs as well. So I told you about the basic requirements under Title IX related to admissions. So what can, what can your um, schools or other, you know, science centers do to increase enrollment of underrepresented students in STEM programs while still complying with the requirements of all the civil rights laws? So one thing that um, we have suggested is considering eliminating prerequisites for admissions. We recognize that this is probably something that may be more applicable at the undergraduate level, maybe less so at the graduate level, but this is something that um, you can do to enable you to meet the needs of all students, to kind of um, broaden your applicant pool, and by broadening your applicant pool, that's gonna result in more applicants um, from the underrepresented groups. So we have anecdotal information of you know, schools that are trying this out. Again, this is not something that's required under the laws. It's just a suggestion that schools can do and still be in compliance with the laws. So we know, um, for instance, that um, having prerequisites like prior programming experience for computer science majors can sometimes decrease the amount of applicants in the applicant pool, particularly applicants who are from those underrepresented groups. Uh, Carnegie Mellon is one such institution that kind of revamped their admissions process a number of years ago, kind of broadening the qualities that they were looking for in applicants and just getting that message out that you don't need prior programming experience. And um, from what we've read and the anecdotal information, that ended up resulting in them having an increase in the applicant pool and helped um, specifically boost their um, women who were represented in their program. <coughs> and people ask, well, how do you then deal with these students coming in with various levels of prior experience, you then just need to think about what are we doing for our introductory courses and maybe you might need to think about restructuring your introductory courses so that you're having kind of ones for students who are coming in with prior experience and ones for students who maybe has, have less experience. Um, some of the other things related to race, we get a lot of questions about how can, you know, there's you know various Supreme Court decisions about the ability or inability of schools to consider race when they're thinking about admissions criteria. So the um, OCR has put out some information about how can, you use, how can you voluntarily consider race and what are some things you can do and still be in compliance with the law and the court decisions. So one of the things that we tell schools they can do is you can think about other factors other than race that may help you still increase that same kind of underrepresentation um, folks in the in your applicant pool, like consider socioeconomic status, first generation college status, geographic residents or other kinds of race neutral factors. Um, think about giving consideration to applicants who went to low performing schools, who have other hardships. Uh, you are also enable, are able to guarantee admission to a top percentile of students graduating from in-state high schools. You can also give preference to students of all races who graduated from high schools with certain socioeconomic or racial compositions. And then you can also consider race of individual students among other factors in admissions if you have that narrowly tailored to your compelling interest. And that's something that you all would need to also talk to your counsel and your, your legal advisors about um, for specific application to your programs. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is when you're considering voluntary use of race is this is under the federal law that OCR enforces, but there may be other state laws that are just applicable to institutions in your state to keep in mind. So another area where we um, 
want to make sure that we're trying to focus on underrepresented students is in recruitment and outreach. So obviously the laws require that you ensure that STEM recruitment materials are free of bias and stereotypes. So for example, um, if your, your engineering program puts out recruitment brochures, uh, keeping in mind that they should not only depict males in these careers and only have information about you know, male students, male professors, males as engineers, it needs to be um, free of that. You need to be inclusive in your materials that you put out. But what else can you do besides you know, just simply complying with the laws? So something that we like to tell, um, at least at the higher ed level, what schools, what the higher ed institutions can do is work with your, look at the K-12 schools in your area. You gotta start young to kind of get various groups of students interested in these areas so that those students at the K-12 schools will then become and form your applicant pool. And the broader your applicant pool is, the more likely you are to actually enroll and be able to admit students from those underrepresented groups. So targeting those schools in your area that maybe um, have, under, have populations of underrepresented students, you could send um, representatives from your science center, from your um, institution to become mentors, to you know, give lessons, to train, offer professional development to those kinds of schools in your area. That can be something. Um, advertise various things at, in the media, at community events, at conferences, targeted at underrepresented groups. That's something else you can do to kind of broaden your applicant pool. Um, consider those pipeline programs that, um, at you know, putting those in place at the K-12 level and then kind of mentoring those students all the way through until they're ready to apply to college. Some other things you can do are um, your, the STEM departments at your institution may um, want to have a real presence at, at the institution's broader outreach, uh, outreach um, events for prospective students. Um, and when you do that, make sure that the representatives from those departments are diverse and are kind of focused on breaking down any stereotypes or things that might exist that may kind of dissuade certain applicants from applying to those programs. Um, I talked about introductory courses and how you may need to tweak how you offer those, specifically if you're um, eliminating prerequisites. So thinking about designing those introductory courses to appeal to a diverse group of students. Harvey Mudd College is, is an example of a school that's done that. They've put, put in place some aspects in their introductory courses to try to appeal to women. Um, talking about the practical um, ways that you can use the certain kinds of degrees. Um, you could also offer early research opportunities that sometimes appeals to students from underrepresented groups. And you make these available to all students, so you're not just limiting it to the underrepresented students, but it has that, then that impact. Retention is also quite similar. Um, like we've talked about, um, in order to, you don't just need to recruit and admit a diverse group of students, you also need to think about how you're gonna retain those students. So you can certainly operate mentoring, tutoring, retention support programs that you offer to all your students, including, um, including the underrepresented students, and that's something that's perfectly acceptable for schools to do. Um, suggestion we give is provide mentoring, tutoring, and academic programs to any student who's at risk of any group, including those underrepresented groups. Um, you can have support programs specifically targeted to, to students aimed at retention, highlight the accomplishments of groups that are um, maybe underrepresented in STEM to kind of give these students something to strive for, uh, providing training to your staff, faculty, and students on implicit bias. Another thing that can come into play with, with retention is those introductory courses and thinking about how are we structuring those courses so that students don't take those courses and get turned off and then end up dropping, dropping out of the program. Uh, many schools have um, requirements that students, particularly at the graduate level and even at the undergraduate level, are paired with an academic faculty advisor. So think about you know, what's your process for pairing people with their advisors? Is it non-discriminatory? Can students request to change advisors? You know, can you, is there any more flexibility that you can give students in that if they feel uncomfortable, uncomfortable with a particular advisor that was assigned to them? That's something to think about. Some schools have started providing counselors to students and to all their students in addition to formal faculty advisors to kind of help them navigate things outside of maybe the academic realm. Um, we found, we've heard that schools have found that these benefit the entire student body and in particular those underrepresented groups where students may feel particularly isolated.
and just want to briefly talk about a few additional things to consider when you're working with students with disabilities. Also, I would say make sure that you, if you have any questions about this or are wondering how this process works at your school, all, virtually all institutions of higher education will have an Office of Disability Services or an Office of Disability Accommodations or something like that on their campus that generally will handle these things, but it's good to just make everyone aware of. So schools are required to make modifications to academic requirements to ensure that those requirements don't discriminate against students on the basis of disability. So examples on the slide are the length of time you permit a student to complete the degree requirements, or um, maybe you might need to adapt the manner in which certain courses are conducted just slightly to accommodate students with disabilities. Perhaps they need to videotape the course or they need to tape record the course or they need an alternative um, to the PowerPoint or something like that. That's something that you might need to provide. Um, uh, you can't impose other rules on students with disabilities that would limit the, the participation of those students. For example, by prohibiting students from um, tape recording lectures or by saying we don't allow animals in the classroom so therefore you can't bring your guide dog to the classroom. Those are some basic examples. Um, again, the law requires you to provide aids to students with disabilities as necessary. These may be tape text, interpreters, um, readers if students have visual impairments, and also adapting classroom um, equipment, and this can come up in science labs and things like that for use of students um, who have certain kinds of manual impairments. And the last thing that our disability folks wanted me to make sure I mentioned is accessible technology, which is kind of a new emerging area. So schools may not require the use of technology in a classroom environment if that technology is inaccessible to students with disabilities unless they can provide accommodations or modifications. One of the um, ways in which this comes up a lot is schools were switching to kind of texts via electronic book reader and things like that, and not all of those devices were accessible to students with disabilities, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, the other thing, the other area where this comes up is textbooks available for students who, use, who read Braille. Sometimes, particularly for math textbooks, it can be difficult to translate um, higher level math into Braille. So there, there are textbooks that are able to accommodate that and, and do it in such a way that students who read Braille can use them, but that's something to keep in mind that may not be on your horizon. Like I said, this last slide is just some other resources. We have a PowerPoint that goes into all these areas or all these issues and, and a bunch more as they relate to the Title IX requirements on our website. That's a very detailed PowerPoint specifically directed to principal investigators and administrators at in institutions of higher education. We have a Title IX resource guide that goes through all the Title IX requirements, also very useful. Um, we have resources on supporting racial diversity under Title VI. Um, and then we also have guidance specifically on the use of those electronic book readers and other emergent technologies for students with disabilities. Also useful. And this is how you can contact OCR, have information for OCR headquarters where I'm located, as well as information for the regional offices. You can uh, click on the drop down menu, find this, and click on your state, and it will provide contact information for the office that serves your state. Before I finish, I just want to quickly say that you all should feel free to reach out to OCR at any time without feeling like you're um, inviting an investigation or anything like that. We provide technical assistance regularly. It doesn't, you don't have to um, identify yourself or your institution, but we're, that is part of our mission. So I just want to get that message out there. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we're, uh, we're going to do it old school. We're going to go through all of the panelists' presentations and then have a full hour of question and answer. Um, so we ask that you hold your questions. But uh, please, if you're thinking of any, please make mental notes, jot them down. And also for our virtual participants, and I, I should have mentioned this earlier, uh, you can send your questions into civilrightsinfo at nasa.gov. We welcome your virtual questions. Uh, next, we will hear from Dr. Laurel Espinoza. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm pleased to be here to talk with you about some of the research that we're doing at the American Council on Education Center for Policy Research and Strategy. And it's actually perfect that I came after Rachel because I'm going to speak with you about some of the work we've been doing around 
uh, admissions, in particular race conscious and race neutral practices, uh, talk a bit about inclusion as it relates to uh, diversity as our conversation has evolved, I know, over the past couple of days and the way that it's evolving nationally. I want to share some data with you as well around some of the uh, student protests around the, around the country on issues of inclusion and what institutions are doing to respond. So I'm going to cover a lot in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that is my challenge. Um, so that's a bit about what I was going to say. So this is a report uh, that we came out with last July, about a year ago, called Race, Class, and College Ac Access, Achieving Diversity in a Shifting Legal Landscape. And the impetus behind the report is a study that we did, a survey study of admissions and enrollment management leaders, so deans of admissions and directors of enrollment management, that type of position. To, to really ask the question of how the legal climate has influenced their admissions practice. So you may know that the consideration of race in admissions is permissible. We just had a Supreme Court ruling in Fisher versus the University of Texas at Austin. Um, it's permissible as one among many considerations in the, in the process. Um, however, it's also true that there are eight states that have banned the consideration of race um, often through voter referendum. And so it's a tricky climate, and there are continuously more and more challenges, challenges to Harvard, challenges to the North Carolina and other places. So this is, this is a tricky climate, and it does influence practice, as you very well know. Um, so this is a little bit about that. I want to first share with you where race is considered at what types of institu institutions. Um, so here's what it looks like. The majority of campuses that admit 40% or less of their applicants uh, consider race in the admissions process, um, again, as one of many factors. Uh, we also know that about a third at the, uh, between 41 and 60% admit rate consider race, about 20% at the 61 to 80% admit rate, and so on. And I think the point of this slide uh, for me or the takeaway of the study is that race is an important consideration across the spectrum. So, you know, we often think about or the public narrative says, you know, it's only used at places like Harvard or only at the most selective institutions. But we see that it's used across the spectrum. It is used more at the most selective. Um, but this is only in admissions. If we thought about financial aid or other areas where there is a consideration or a targeted approach, um, this might look very different. Um, so that's just the landscape so you have it in mind. Now, I'm just going to share a couple other data points here. We asked, you know, what, what strategies are you using to uh, increase racial and ethnic as well as socioeconomic diversity on your campuses? And I think this can apply uh, beyond the institutional context. If you work with students at all uh, in, in whatever setting, whether it be K-12 students who are aspiring to college, it's worth knowing what practices are being used. Um, so you can advise your students accordingly. So we asked about 20 different strategies, uh, and we took them from our peers at, our, our association peers at some of the admissions associations. Uh, the College Board worked with us on this project as well. But I'm going to share with you the top five strategies, if you can um, see them. The first one is articulation agreements with other institutions. And this plays very well with the um, the third area there, which is recruitment and additional consideration for community college transfers. So community colleges is where the majority of our nation's uh, students of color are enrolled, right? Particularly Hispanic and black students and other uh, communities of color. Also targeted applicant recruitment, holistic application review, which is a requirement if you consider race in the admissions process. So this list is actually very, very heavy, as you can see, on outreach and recruitment, consideration for where students of color are coming from. Low income students are also more likely to be enrolled in two year institutions. So that's a bit about what, what is being used. If we look at sort of the bottom five, and I say the bottom five kind of loosely because about a third of institutions are also using targeted financial aid, um, reduced emphasis on SAT and ACT scores, and also reduced emphasis on legacy admissions, about a quarter of the institutions. Uh, test optional admissions is low on the usage, but I'll share something with you in the next slide that you might find surprising about that. And then percentage plans. So I know Rachel mentioned percentage plans, and that's where uh, you might guarantee, in Texas's case, uh, you know, ten, the first top 10% of the class guaranteed admission. Uh, for all of the sort of uh, controversy and discussion around these plans, they're not very widely used, just 13% of the institutions, the 338 in our study. So that's what's being used, uh, the top and the bottom and the top. 
And uh, now, what are, what are the schools finding effective? So that, that's somewhat of a different story, right? Um, not wholly, fortunately, um, but this is according to their data. So they said, well, we have data to show the effectiveness of these things, uh, actual hard data. Um, so here's what we see at the top. We see yield recruitment. So this is actually very important for everyone uh, in the room who, who admits students. Actually, the, the, most, uh, the most gains that these institutions are finding for racial diversity, now I'm really focusing on race here and ethnicity, uh, is the, the recruitment you do after the students are admitted, getting them to the campus, having faculty call them, um, you know, doing some targeted outreach online. Uh, we know that actually high school students are best reached by text message these days, not by email. Um, so however you do it, you're doing that once they're admitted. Uh, test optional admission. So remember I said it's not widely used. 68% uh, of the campuses that use it are finding it to be effective. Um, so I know Rachel said there's some ways that you can go about, um, about those lines. Holistic application review, as I mentioned, it, which is a requirement for considering race. But it doesn't mean you have to consider race, race to do it. You might do it to look at low income uh, or, or background of, of students, the neighborhoods they come from, the context that they you know, go to school in. That's all perfectly reasonable to do whether you use race or not. Uh, yield initiatives and targeted applicant recruitment. Um, just to go over highlights here, percentage plans. So the 13% that use them, about 40% consider them to be effective. They're not a silver bullet. That's the other thing we found out in Fisher if you followed that case. Um, I think a missed opportunity for the professional development of K-12 educators. So that, that is only down there at um, 30%, which again, I think could be uh, a missed opportunity, but not necessarily finding it effective. It may not be that the engagement is very high, and that's between the institutions and the K-12 settings. Um, so that's a bit about what we found. This is a very long report, about 100 pages. It has a good executive summary, though. So if you want to um, check out more about that report, I'm just going to go past some of this animation. Uh, but I want to switch gears and talk about retention and inclusion, because we know that numbers are, are absolutely relevant to having inclusive environments, meaning the number of students of color you have. But we also know that numbers are not alone sufficient for inclusive environments. So this quote comes from Liliana Garces of Penn State and Uma Jaya Kumar at the University of San Francisco. They wrote a blog for us on a concept they call dynamic diversity, which I can talk to later. But they say, while numbers are necessary for realizing the benefits of diversity, and that benefit is what allows institutions to consider race, they are not alone sufficient. What we need moving forward is a shift in our understanding of diversity as solely a numbers game. So that, that really has come out in the past couple of days. It certainly came out in the last panel that inclusion is the name of the game. It's not just about the students being there. It's about making sure that they feel uh, welcome. So we, we actually know a lot about this, about sense of belonging and climate from a research perspective. This research has been going on for decades, as early as the late 1960s. Sedlicek was mentioned earlier in 1967 with his co-author addressed racial attitudes by college students. We've seen work from 1973 that explored alienation as a contributor to a campus's climate. Uh, also, in 1974, Pfeiffer and Schneider put forth seminal work on what they called university climate. These are, these are words that we now use every day, uh, campus racial climate, inclusion, sense of belonging. Um, fortunate for the practitioners, there's a rich body of research to lean on, and that's my message today, is to try to bring the research to practice. Um, and when we talk about climate, we really do mean the attitudes, the behaviors, the standards of practice, everything you've been hearing about of employees of an institution and also of the students. So when we think about climate, it of course extends beyond students. Um, I want to say a little bit about work being done on women of color in STEM. This is actually my area of expertise. My dissertation work was on women of color in STEM. And I just want to point out this work by Dawn Johnson uh, in her recent 2012 article, which was based on a study. She's doing a whole host of work on this topic, so I do encourage you to look into this if this is of interest. Um, this reinforces what we've heard over the last couple of days, which is that transformative practice requires that institutions take the responsibility 
for transformation of STEM environments and not put the onus only on the student. There's, there's a tendency to say, well, students just need to toughen up. Well, they're not prepared enough. Well, uh, you know, they, they aren't engaged, they're not studying, whatever it is that we, we have this mindset, which we also refer in the research community as a deficit mindset, instead of really uh, harnessing and celebrating the strengths that students bring. And it's, the on, it's on the institution to make that change. It's not solely on the student to make the change. So that's her point. Um, faculty from dominant groups are especially critical to this effort, as we've heard. Uh, supportive academic and social climates. Now, when she thinks about climate, she's thinking about in the STEM environment, but also I want, I want you to consider for a moment the, the situation that STEM students find themselves in, perhaps in departments that have uh, known history of bias and, and discrimination and uh, places where students can feel marginalized if they come from the not dominant group. So they have that they're facing in the STEM department. They may be on a broader campus now that is also sending those messages. So this is a new kind of double bind, if we want to use that term that comes from the early work on women of color in STEM. Um, so I just want to put it out there for consideration and perhaps discussion later. She found the residence halls in the case of this study to be instrumental place for students to find that sense of belonging. STEM students in particular, STEM women of color in particular, um, as well as their perceptions of the climate. So that, that goes beyond the STEM department, as I, as I said. Um, I did some work with Gary Orfield at the UCL, UCLA sorry, Civil Rights Project and Mia Ong at Turk in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And if, again, this, this topic is of interest to you, women of color in STEM, we published part of our work in the Harvard Educational Review. My dissertation work is also in this volume. It's called Unraveling the Double Bind, Women of Color in STEM. And I just bring it up here to say that campus climate was an, a finding that we took away. So we did a 40-year look at empirical research on this topic and synthesized that. So it's a synthesis study. Um, campus climate, as we saw, played a critical role in retention and satisfaction of women of color in STEM, of all women in STEM, but we are focused on women of color. Um, so again, this it goes beyond the STEM department. Uh, family and community were also very important. I'm going to just go through these a little bit quickly, being mindful of time. Uh, Student-faculty relationships and peer support are critical. Um, these are also relationships that can do harm, however, so we need to think about both sides of that coin. Um, something that was mentioned in the panel a moment ago was that women of color um, often harness their, their status as sort of an outsider to do uh, really successful things. They use it to harness their own personal empowerment. That was a very clear takeaway out of our work and is another thing just to put on the table for consideration and how we empower students um, to get uh, sort of in a non-deficit way. Think about the strengths they're bringing. Um, I'm actually going to go past this model here because I want to, I can come back to it later around science identity, um, but I want to talk before I end on what students have been demanding around the country. Uh, so this is an analysis that my center did, our postdocs actually did this, uh, on what students are demanding. So if you want to see the list of demands, there are many. They're on the demands.org, and we did a qualitative analysis of the demands. The um, place where you can find this before I before I go there, actually, the place you can find this is Higher Education Today, which is ACE's blog. And based on this, we have actually have a whole series on campus racial climate written by researchers from the field, uh, from different ACE member institutions and other places in Washington. There are 11 posts now. It's pretty impressive. It's exciting to see. There's a whole post on microaggressions, if that's a topic of interest. Um, but anyway, they did this, what are students demanding? So 91% of the lists now of, of the demand said they want campuses to revisit policies, and this could be any Anything from making policies more transparent, making sure students are involved in policy making, to addressing uh, policies around hate speech and bias. So this really, and this is all um, in much more detail on the blog. So if you want to just check out sort of the sub areas of that revised policy, you can see it there. Um, increasing resources, 88% of the demand said we, we want to see more resources for students of color for marginalized populations. Increasing diversity, so the numbers are still important, as I said. Uh, we're talking beyond the numbers, but absolutely critical. There was a, sp there was a special emphasis on faculty diversity, which you know, I know we've talked about. 
diversity training and, and cultural competency training for students, for faculty, for staff, and also for campus police uh, was a prominent theme at 71%. Um, revisiting the curriculum, so this has to do with embedding diversity into a curriculum, or in some cases it was establishing diversity requirements or whole diversity specific courses. Uh, and then finally, increasing student support services, in particular services, which is slightly different than the resources piece. Uh, I'm just gonna share one more very busy slide, but what we did was we, we had a survey of college presidents that we put together following on that demands list. And what we did is we asked college presidents, we had over 500 presidents respond, so this is a very uh, noteworthy effort. And we asked exactly about those different themes that students has, had raised. So you'll see the purple bars are similar to the bars before. What we see is that campuses are prioritizing uh, these various issues. This is over the last five years we asked about. Um, again, this is on higher education today, so you can see the many other questions we asked and kind of the different breakdowns. Um, but we are seeing a readdressing of policy, not quite at the majority, but we're seeing a majority of, of these campuses looking at resources, increasing resources, paying attention to diversity. Uh, just about a third have, have in the past five years revisited their curriculum, so I think that as many uh, would agree is an area that we should be focusing on. Fortunately, if you look at the, uh, the blog, you'll see that about a third of campuses are on their way to do that. So I think the message is getting through. Um, but I think the, the takeaway from this slide is that we've, we are making, campuses are making an effort. You know, I, I'm not, I can't tell you the, the outcomes or the validity of those efforts, but it is on the radar of the college president, which again, I find very um, encouraging, but we also know that there's a long way to go. Uh, so I'm gonna stop there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Don't look at me. Um, thank you very much, Lorel. And now we welcome Dr. Christine Reach. Good afternoon. What a summit. This has been incredible. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different um, stance in terms of what I'm presenting. And I'm going to present to you what I think compliance can look like at an organization. Um, we've been working for well over 30 years to make Museum of Science inclusive of people with disabilities. And so I want to present to you kind of a case study for what inclusion looks like and let you know that it, this is an ongoing process for us. We are by no means perfect, but we strive for perfection and we always will. Before I do, I want to start with a little bit of a personal story that um, has been coming to my mind throughout this entire summit, which is that I was an undergraduate who um, studied engineering. And I had a very supportive dad who really wanted a daughter who was an engineer. And about halfway through, um, I called him up because I felt disillusioned. And I said, you know, I went into science and engineering because I wanted to make a difference in the world. All I'm learning about it are all these theories and doing mathematical equations. I don't feel like I'm ever going to get to make a difference. Um, it's a competitive environment. Um, everyone works in isolation. People don't do, engage in collaborative work. I'm ready to quit. I'm going to become an art history major. And my parents, who were working really hard to send me to a private university, flipped out. And my dad said, what are you going to do with that? Work in a museum? <laughs> and here I am. <laughs> Luckily for me, um, he said that. And I persisted with my engineering degree. And I, very next semester, um, worked with a female engineering professor who decided to do something innovative, this is many, many years ago, and introduced project-based learning. And had um, the students work on real-world projects where we learned about engineering, and one of those projects was creating toys for disabled children. And so um, those are really formative experiences for me that it just keep coming to mind. And what that taught me was not just that um, I wanted to prove my dad wrong and get an engineering degree and work in a museum, um, but for me, the way that the environment was designed had a huge impact on whether or not I felt that STEM was for me. And that's something that holds true for me um, that I, I keep in mind every single day of my work. Working at the Museum of Science for over 20 years, I've had a variety of different roles, but always what I'm keeping in mind is how I design things, how my staff designs the experience, 
all sends a message about who belongs and who does not belong in STEM, who is able and who is disabled to learn. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So my first inspiration at the Museum of Science was a woman, um, Betty Davidson. She has her PhD in biochemistry. She retired from the Museum of Science 15 years ago. Um, so a female, PhD in biochemistry. Um, for me, before I even heard the term intersectionality, before it was even developed, she um, exhibited that. Um, she's also had a disability and was barred from school up until the age of 11. So imagine being a female, barred from school, and being able to still get a PhD in biochemistry. And what um, she taught me was that one of the most pervasive messages of her life was not for you. Everywhere she went, what she was told is, this world is not for you. She says that's something that's incredibly destructive for the life of a child. Places like science museums can dispel those messages more than almost any place else. I remember my few visits to museums as wonderful. I believe everybody should have that experience, and I do mean everybody. So at the Museum of Science, we have a vision for accessibility. We actually work hard to achieve um, gender equity in our programming and our exhibits. We have a new effort to really reach out to um, racial and ethnic groups that are traditionally underrepresented in STEM. Um, but we've done a lot of work. Um, we have a specific statement around people with disabilities. And we state that we are committed to the inclusion of people with disabilities and will create an environment that is inviting, engaging, and accessible for everyone. We view ourselves as the group that's filtering in. We want to excite, empower, and engage everyone to see STEM learning as something that's for them. Um, and to do that takes a whole organization um, and everyone have, taking an effort. So what does that mean in practice? I'm gonna just paint a picture for what this looks like at the Museum of Science. Uh, well, we focus on inclusion in all of our programming to make sure that it's accessible to a broad audience. So here we have pictures from our latest gallery that just opened in March. And um, what you can see on the left-hand side is um, a picture of different fish species that are found in the Charles River, which is right next to an aquarium tank. Um, what you probably can't tell from this image is that all of the fish are actually um, 3D printed so that um, there's a tactile outline of the shape of all the different fish species. So even if you can't see, you can feel the wall and get a sense of the diversity um, of fish species. We also have audio labels in addition to all of our text labels. Um, so everything we do, we're just embedding it in. It's not a separate program. It doesn't require um, separate access, calling in advance. It's just part of our environment. And we do that by employing a universal design approach. I'm assuming many of you have heard this idea. It's designed for environments that reach a broad range of users. It's instead of thinking of, as we talked about yesterday, that average um, male pilot, thinking about everyone as being on a spectrum of able to disable. So you don't think about people as either being sighted or blind. You recognize that everyone has a spectrum of visual abilities, cognitive abilities, um, hearing abilities. So this is an example of um, our label strategy and what that means from a universal design standpoint. On the top, you see a traditional text label that you would find in a museum where we're communicating what to do at the interactive using text. Um, that's how we used to design things. On the bottom, what you see is that we're starting to embrace the use of images more and more so that immediately you get the idea of what it is that you can do. So that enables someone who's dyslexic to immediately engage. It helps people for whom English is not their first language, including people who are culturally deaf, um, who speak American Sign Language as their first language. It also tends to help early learners. So my son, who's three, can immediately walk up to our interactives and get a feel for what to do. So that's what it means to be designing for universal design, is thinking about the broad spectrum of learners and taking away traditional barriers, text as a traditional barrier, and redesigning to be more inclusive. But we also recognize that that's not enough, that there are certain audiences who need additional support through programming. So our museum is very large, so we offer sighted guides for people who are blind to help them wayfind around the organization. We also have a special program for um, children on the autism spectrum. They can come to the museum with occupational therapists who use the museum's exhibits to teach them social skills. And this is in partnership with local schools. Um, at the same time, they learn how to use the museum environment with these occupational therapists so that they can come back with their family. So it's a different kind of programming. Um, it's not a separate time period where we say this is our aut autism only, but rather we're trying to help children learn how to use the museum so that the parents feel more comfortable bringing them in. Um, we embed accessibility into all of our major initiatives. 
So again, rather than thinking of it being a separate thing, um, every time we have a major initiative, we say accessibility is going to be one of our goals. This is really effective from a practical standpoint, which is that it costs a lot less to design for accessibility from the beginning than it is, does to retrofit. Um, so rather than tackling the entire building at once, which we financially we can't afford, and even if we could, it would be a lot of um, less than less than perfect solutions. Um, every time we have a major initiative, we say, okay, we're going to redesign pieces here. Um, so this is a picture of our box office. We just redesigned it. And you might notice that the staff are all seated and the visitors walk up and are standing. Prior to the redesign, the desks were a really high um, countertop, which is what you see in most ticket offices. That meant that someone in a wheelchair had to go to a special wheelchair-only counter, um, which kind of created some barriers for them. It also meant that we couldn't hire people in wheelchairs to work in our ticket office. So the design of our ticket space was precluding certain people from being hired at our organization. Um, the fun benefit is that now that the counter is loaded, we have so many young children that come, they can now engage in the ticket buying with their parents and feel more included in the process. Um, we also need to recognize, though, that sometimes we do need to make changes before a major effort. So we do have limited um, resources, monetary resources that we set aside for key amenities. And sometimes those are really small. Um, so the picture here is of our stanchions, which we use as barriers for lines throughout the building. Um, many people may not know that if um, you, there's a compliance requirement that um, things ne need to be at least 27 inches um, or no more than 27 inches off the ground in order to be detectable with a cane if you're blind. Um, all of our stanchion barriers were just the top row, which meant if you were blind, you couldn't find the stanchions, and people who were blind were getting caught in them um, when they were trying to find the places to queue up. So we actually just spent over $10,000 purchasing new stanchions um, to make sure that that didn't happen again. Um, a key part of kind of facilitating change is involving people with disabilities in the work. If we want to make ourselves an organization that's welcoming for people with disabilities, we need to make sure that people with disabilities are out there on the front lines so people can see that they belong here. Um, what we've also found, however, is that when you work with people with disabilities, it's more likely to change the organizational culture. And this is true not just in museums, but in many different kinds of organizations that have been, uh, that have looked at ways to change the culture to be more accessible. Involving a person with a disability in the work means that you're no longer changing for an abstract audience or this idea of an individual. You're making changes for a friend and colleague. Um, so I've seen this at um, other museums that I've studied. The people with disabilities who become part of the organization become kind of like a rallying cry. It's really hard to tell your friend and colleague, this exhibit that we're all creating together is not going to be accessible for you. So it really personalizes the effort. Um, so it matches what was talked about earlier in terms of kind of being diverse creates more diversity. Um, we also work as an organization to offer professional development for all of our museum staff members. So every single new employee has to go through an online accessibility training that talks about not just what accessibility is, but also um, what types of accommodations we offer throughout the entire um, organization. One of the bigger challenges for us is that we also have between six and 700 volunteers that are only in the organization once a week. Um, and they're often our frontline staff, and they're mostly retirees um, who haven't thought about a lot about um, inclusion of people with disabilities before, but many of whom have disabilities but may not recognize it themselves. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of work now trying to figure out how we also reach those volunteers and involve them in our professional development offerings. The last strategy that we employ is really experimenting with new approaches. Um, we want to make sure that everything we do is as accessible as possible. One of the challenges that we have is that um, we're kind of, in many cases, starting from scratch. Many people out there aren't also making their environments accessible for people with disabilities. So we need to develop approaches on our own. The great news is, is that we do a lot of prototype testing of all of our exhibits and program, so we test them out with the public, so we involve people with disabilities in that testing as a way to um, create those new developments and designs. 
Um, this picture here is of a new um, virtual river table that we have. Um, it's actually a series of projectors that are hung from the ceiling down onto a table. It's a tactile table, um, so it's hand carved to represent a, a river environment. And there are tactile pieces that are 3D printed that you can pick up and place along the riverbed. And as you do, different things in the river happen. Um, and the response is both visual and auditory. So um, one of the, and they're all made to be lightweight, so even if you have limited upper body strength, um, you can work these tactile pieces. So you put one in um, and you create a river environment that's better um, for swimming. You not only see the virtual people going swimming in the river, you also hear the cheers and the excitement of swimming in the river. Um, you get tact, um, auditory feedback as well on text as that's happening. So how did we become this organization that has really embraced inclusion of people with disabilities? I already mentioned um, Betty Davidson, my friend and mentor. Um, for a long time, um, what we, story we told is that Betty came, she taught us the error of our ways, um, she taught us that creating environments that are better for people with disabilities are also better for everyone, and voila, there was a change. It was magical. One person um, made it all happen. If you talk to Betty, she will tell you that is very much not what happened. Um, and over time, what we've realized is that we've had fits and starts. Um, we've had moments where we've done a lot of activity and then moments where we've backtracked. Um, and what I'm going to do is show you a video um, we actually created for NASA that talks about how their compliance um, influenced our organizational narrative. I'm thinking that the... Accessibility at the Museum of Science. And that is our old lobby that's now been redone. Christine Reach, Director of Exhibit Development, Co-Chair of the Accessibility Committee. We think about accessibility in three different ways in the museum. The first is one way that many museums think about accessibility, which is making sure that people with disabilities can be physically present within our museum. So we want them to be able to access the museum to get in using ramps, make sure that there's adequate elevator services, um, adequate cane detection for people who are blind, uh, but that's only the beginning. We also want people to be able to learn about science, technology, engineering in our museum um, and have fun doing it. And third, we want to make sure that people with disabilities feel socially included, that they view the museum as a place that's for them, where they can come at any time, and see the museum as a place where they can bring their friends and families and enjoy learning about science together as a group. Nora Nagel. ADA and 504 Accessibility Coordinator. Ideally, our goal is to have a visitor with a disability have exactly the same experience as every other visitor. We don't want their visit to be different than anybody else's. We want it to be exactly like everybody else's because that's how it should be. Early Steps Toward Accessibility. Larry Bell, Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives. I was um, involved in exhibit development starting back in the late 70s, and I think back then we didn't really have any concept of what accessibility was all about. I think we actually thought that if you made something accessible for one group of people, it made it bad or worse for other people. Back in the mid-1980s, Betty Davidson came to volunteer at the museum. She was a person who had a physical disability, a mobility impairment. Uh, and she encouraged us politely but insistently that we take an inventory of the accessibility of exhibits in the museum. We came up with the idea of making some changes in this exhibit gallery that we're sitting in right now, the New England Habitats diorama area. The idea was that this was a kind of an exhibit that was totally useless to blind visitors because everything that was available for them to learn was behind glass, depended on you seeing through the glass. So we wanted to look at whether there are ways we could um, take this space and make it accessible to people who are blind. 
add things to it to touch, to smell, to listen to um, that would help uh, people who are blind get the same ideas that people who are sighted uh, when they come into this exhibit hall. After we developed the additions to this gallery, we evaluated it with people with disabilities and with the general visitors to the museum as well to see what impact the changes had on all of the audiences that come uh, to the museum. And to our surprise, um, the exhibit was incredibly better for everyone, not just to the pe for the people who had the disabilities. We also found that the conversation in the gallery went up. People were having a more social experience when they're in the museum. And then finally, the time spent in the exhibition gallery also dramatically increased. So people wanted to be in that gallery more. Once we had that early experience, we realized that we didn't have to choose between um, designing for people without disabilities and designing for people with disabilities. That when we designed for people with disabilities, it made the experience better for everyone. The museum has had a long-standing history of thinking about the inclusion of people with disabilities. A lot of that early work happened within the exhibitions department, but there were isolated projects and efforts that were taking place across the Museum of Science as a whole. In recent years, we've started working more cohesively together to make sure that the entire museum experience is accessible for people with disabilities. Results of the NASA Accessibility Review Britton O'Brien Vice President of Human Resources, and Wayne Bouchard, Chief Operating Officer. So probably five or six years ago, we, we found ourselves um, in a dilemma in an area where we thought we were fairly proficient in dealing with issues of accessibility and diversity. It's a, it was a source of pride in many respects, certainly from exhibit design. Um, from going from that to hearing that we were actually deficient in many areas in terms of our thinking and kind of being put on notice caught us by surprise. And we immediately went into high gear and turned that into a positive and in a very short amount of time going from a, a deficiency um, perspective to now hopefully NASA considering us one of their best practice institutions. After the NASA audit, uh, we engaged the Institute for Human Centered Design located here in Boston uh, to come in as a consultant and do a very thorough review and uh, of the facility and to give us suggestions on what we could do to improve the facility and they came up with a very specific group of suggestions they brought in a number of community groups people from varying types of disabilities um, and they were a delight to work with and they really really gave us something to work from Advice to other museums. So if there's one piece of advice I would give to another exhibits department, it would be to work closely with people with disabilities. That's a way that you can really learn how to change your practices and become a more inclusive organization. So hiring people with disabilities to be a part of your department is critical. And that includes making sure that your work environment is inclusive of people with disabilities. Bringing in volunteers with disabilities. There's many job life skills groups that want people with disabilities to have the opportunity to learn job skills and they can use your museum as a resource and you learn about um, disability at the same time. You can also hire people with disabilities to serve as consultants on exhibition teams. When you do that, that person becomes a member of your exhibition team and you're always cognizant that you're creating an experience that will work for that particular friend and, and colleague. And then finally, testing out exhibit components with people with disabilities as part of your prototyping process is also another critical way that you can learn to be more inclusive. The advice that I would give to an institution thinking about making accessibility um, a higher priority or something that they want to do a better job of is to look at it as an opportunity rather than a deficiency or a problem um, because it truly is something that is beneficial to everyone that comes through the organization. Visitors, staff, um, everyone benefits from an effective accessibility program. It's not something that you want to approach from a policing perspective. That's not a good incentive. What's next? 
The more we work with people with disabilities, the more we learn about what it takes to create an accessible environment. So if we're always in this continuous improvement framework, we're always going to get better at being inclusive, and that's where I want us to be. I don't see this ever ending. It's just a, a way of life and becomes more and more ingrained in the institution, not only with the exhibits that we produce, but the uh, population that we want to employ and the population that we want to engage in the museum. Yeah, and a big goal for us is to be a best practice institution. And we, we pride ourselves in, in being a leader in this area. Um, we want to walk the talk, so uh, I feel like we are. Um, but as Britt said, it's never done. So I'm just going to do one bit of conclusion, which is that what was really important about the NASA audit was that it wasn't, as they said, from a policing perspective. The things that NASA did actually are consistent with what we know can facilitate organizational learning. Um, so the Institute for Human-Centered Design that was referenced that came in to kind of help us out with the audit, that is a group of people with disabilities. Um, they made us form an accessibility committee, um, or they invited us to encourage us to form an accessibility committee that really brought together the work of the organization as a whole, and that helped us to engage in regular communication around this. Um, and another piece that was really important is that we had the narrative within the organization already that inclusion of people with disabilities improves inclusion for people without disabilities. Um, and what we have found is that not only in our organization but in others, when that narrative exists, the organization is more likely to persist with its inclusion work. Um, so we were able to have a conversation because of the NASA audit to get beyond it being about compliance with the law and really being about um, creating an environment that works well for everyone. So thank you. Thank you, Christine. I remember that audit. We went up to Boston in a February, Bob Cosgrove and Omega Jones from Brenda's office, and you didn't snow on us, so we were happy about that. <clears throat> Our last uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Joni Baker. Howdy. You can tell I'm from Texas A&M. So thank you, David. It is indeed a pleasure and an honor to participate in this historic summit. The Texas A&M University system is a consortium of 11 universities, seven state agencies. It includes a law school, a medical school, a veterinary school, and a comprehensive health science center. Collectively, we educate over 140,000 students per year. We provide services in all 254 counties in Texas, and we employ nearly 25,000 faculty and staff. Texas A&M University and College Station is a tier one research institution and one of only 17 institutions in the country that have land grant, sea grant, and space grant status. It is the fourth largest university in, this, in the nation. Our College of Engineering has 14 departments, including, of course, aerospace engineering, has over 500 faculty members and more than 16,000 engineering students, both undergraduate and graduate. Our College of Geosciences includes the Department of Atmospheric Sciences, which is one of the largest meteorology programs in the nation. So A&M was founded in 1876. It was essentially an, uh, an all-male institution, which required students to be members of the Corps of Cadets and receive military training. This was the case up until the 1960s. Early 1960s, we officially admitted women and man, uh, membership in the Corps of Cadets became optional. So now in 2016, Texas A&M's student population of over 60,000 is nearly half women. And according to uh, College Choice, it is one of the best colleges for women. U.S. News and World's report has ranked our, our aerospace engineering graduate program as 10th best in the country and its undergraduate program as 12th best. BestColleges.com recently rated Texas A&M as the 12th best in the country for women studying in the STEM fields. So one area which sets Texas A&M apart uh, from many other top schools in the country is the representation of women in high-level positions, i.e. the role models that we've been talking about uh, since yesterday. 
Dr. Elsa Morano, who is an immigrant from Cuba, became the university's first female and first Hispanic American president. That was in 2008. For the past five years, Dr. Karen Watson has served as our provost and executive vice president. Dr. Watson is also a professional engineer and is a regents professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and also in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. She's received many awards, including the U.S. President's Award for Mentoring Minorities and Women in Science and Technology. Dr. Katherine Banks, which we'll see a video from her very shortly, is our Vice Chancellor of the A&M System for Engineering and Dean of Engineering on main campus. Dr. Valerie Taylor is our Senior Associate Dean of Engineering for Academic Affairs. Dr. Taylor is also Executive Director of the Center for Minorities and People with Disabilities in IT, a nonprofit organization which supports the entry of minorities and individuals with disabilities into the information technology field. Until very recently, Dr. Kate Miller was our Dean of the College of Geosciences. The current department heads of computer science and engineering and civil engineering are women. Our female STEM students are supported by a number of organizations, including over uh, more than 40 engineering student organizations. These include Aggie Aerospace Women in Engineering, Aggie Women in Computer Science, Women in Nuclear, Women in Science and Engineering, Females Leading Aggies as Mentors in Engineering, and Chapters of the Society of Women Engineers in the Association for Women in Mathematics. Organizations supporting underrepresented students in STEM fields include the Organization for Cultural Diversity in Chemistry, and chapters of the National Society for Black Engineers, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, the Society of Mexican American Engineers and Scientists, the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. Female employees are supported by the Women's Faculty Network, the Women Administrators Network, and the Women in Engineering Faculty Interest Group. At the university level, female students have held and do hold similar leadership roles. For the second year in a row, a female student is the commander of our Corps of Cadets, which is the largest military officer training program outside of the service academies. This Hispanic student, Cecile Sorio, is majoring in atmospheric sciences. Our first female student body president was elected in 1993, and our current student body president is female, as was last year's. The new junior and sophomore class presidents are female. In January of 2013, our A&M System Chancellor announced plans for Texas A&M to grow engineering enrollment to 25,000 engineering students by 2025. This is known as our 25 by 25 initiative. Through innovative educational and recruitment programs, A&M is leading the way to become the largest and most diverse engineering program in the country. A big part of this effort is to find students who might otherwise not be willing or be able to attend college outside of their local community. They may think that they don't have the money, that they don't want to leave home, uh, or they think that they don't belong. So this is an untapped resource that we are targeting to bring these students into our engineering programs. So what are some of these, uh, in, uh, these recruiting efforts? Well, as most universities and colleges, I think, we run a large number of summer camps, including what we call Camp SOAR, S-O-A-R. This stands for Summer Opportunities in Aerospace Research, which is for high school seniors and juniors who are interested in aerospace engineering. Women Explore Engineering is for female high school students. ENGAGE, which stands for Engineering Aggies Getting Experience, is a summer camp for high school students in the STEM fields. And GOX camp exposes high achieving junior and senior uh, students in the geosciences. Now, I promised uh, David I would speak briefly about our NASA compliance review, which sort of dovetails quite nicely into uh, the review on the museum. Um, our review took place, it was a Title IX compliance review. It took place in 2013 and 2014. 
I can honestly say it was a pleasure to be audited. Okay, you're supposed to laugh there. <laughs> While most people may fear the grim reaper, oh, I'm sorry, the auditors, uh, my approach has been similar. It's always been to use such reviews as two-way educational opportunities. I knew we had a lot of good programs and activities to increase and support women and minorities in the STEM areas. But I also knew that we could learn from NASA's experience at other universities and organizations. So we took the opportunity to highlight a number of our initiatives, which included a new Title IX training video that we produced using students at three of our campuses' universities, including an HCBU and a Hispanic-serving institution. We highlighted programs and activities sponsored by our Women's Resource Center. Uh, we highlighted the Becky Gates Children's Center, which provides daycare for the children of faculty, staff, and students. And of course, we do have a, a very advanced, advanced program funded by NSF, and uh, another NSF-sponsored program to provide research experiences for underrepresented students in STEM fields. We also uh, told David and Bob and Sharon at the time about our initial self, uh, Title IX self-evaluation, as well as our ongoing campus surveys of faculty, staff, and students. Those were climate surveys. And of course, the plethora of diversity training programs going on on campus. So that being said, uh, the NASA Title IX review did open our eyes to areas that had not been analyzed from a gender equity point of view. Specifically, for the first time, to my knowledge, we looked at application, admission, matriculation, and graduation rates, the provision of financial aid, research opportunities, and thesis and dissertation success rates. So after the, uh, the NASA compliance review, I gave a presentation to all of our engineering department heads on the scope and the results of the review. And I believe this prompted an overall commitment to be more attentive to equity for all groups in our academic programs and processes. Now I have two short videos that I'd like to show and then I'll turn it back over to David. The issues of inclusion with regard to both women and underrepresented minority students is of great concern to me as well. So we're now at 20% women. We have a goal in 2025 to be at 36% women. We also have a goal over the next 13 years to increase our percentage of underrepresented minorities to 36%. That's going to take a different approach. Recruiting these students is difficult. There is a new concept, certainly a new book that has been written by the National Academy, and it's called Changing the Conversation. It, is, it actually presents ways to talk about engineering uh, that would allow both underrepresented minorities and women to see themselves in this career. We all need to step back and think about how do we talk about engineering to our 10-year-old, to our 5-year-old, to our 3-year-old. How do we portray this positive impression of our discipline, even in preschool. So that's a challenge for us, is not just accepting the students who apply, but to allow for a more diverse pool of students to choose from. Are you gonna take your second room? Definitely my favorite part of the entire camp was just seeing all of our hard work and just everything coming together in the end because there's the software, there's the hardware, we had to solder our own circuit board. So it's just seeing everything that we did, every little thing contributing to the big picture. It's really cool. One, go! Look out, look out! I've always had family and family friends telling me that I should be an engineer and I would really fit there. It was just the different engineering path I wanted to take and I really want to be an astronaut. Like I never grew out of that little childhood phase and at this camp I realized that being an aerospace engineer doesn't send you to space, it sends the rockets to space. But doing the electrical systems or just something smaller actually gets you into space and then you get to work in the space station, in the pod, 
and you're more likely to actually get to do something. Thank you very much. I think we heard some really fantastic things, some great ideas. Um, I, I'd like to point out that um, we, with our compliance reviews, we, we look both to enhance existing compliance as well as to bring institutions into full compliance where we see compliance issues. So um, with that said, I'd like to, I wrote down a lot of questions uh, for the panelists, but what I'd really like to do is open it up to the audience, uh, both here and our virtual participants, um, to find out whether or not you have any questions for our panelists. Gentleman right here. Thank you all. My name is Richard Ignis. I'm from East Tennessee State University. I'm an astrophysicist. And I'm also a director of undergraduate research. In my work, I often think in terms of diagnostics, and I was struck, this question I guess is for Dr. Espinoza, I uh, was struck by one of your slides where it referred to, I forget how it was worded, but something in relation to climate policy and such things for retention and satisfaction. Uh, the satisfaction part caught my attention there. And I was just wondering if perhaps, uh, the representation of diversity among alumni givers mm. is an indicator of satisfaction and what might be known about there. Are you able to, to that, comment on women and minorities as alumni donors? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And uh, so I have not studied alumni, but I have been, as some of you might have seen some stories uh, recently, there might have been one in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Chronicle that um, the student protests nationwide has actually, in this particular story, uh, had seen giving go down because alumni are very displeased with the way that campuses are, are kind of handling that issue. Um, this tension between freedom of expression and inclusion is a really tenuous one and that, you know, it's very polarized. Um, and so I don't know if that, I'm, I'm not really answering your question about alumni givers. I, I think it's, it's um, I think, though to the first part of your question is certainly if you're seeing uh, people of color and, and women and you know the the groups that um, you're working to advance give to the institution that's a huge signal <laughs> i might also mention that some of those people come from backgrounds that you know they they don't have a lot of capital to start with and maybe taking out student loans and may not be able to give uh, for many years so it's it's a it's a kind of a tricky measure um, yeah. Sure. Uh, I, I guess it gives people an opportunity to. Reflect. Of course, there's a push to help to get students to give right away, even in smaller amounts, because yeah. it establishes a practice. Mm -hmm. But you know, just I'm not sure the kind of data is collected that you would yeah. need. Yeah. No, but I. I, I would think you. that institutions know an awful lot about their donors, <laughs> and so um, with that time lag, you know, if people if people are giving and demographics of those donors would be an indicator of relative satisfaction amongst the different people. Yeah, maybe the demographic, yeah, not the amount. I think somebody in the audience might chime in. Okay, totally different hat on, but I was on my university's foundation board and we did a, sir, a study on women in philanthropy. There's actually some schools in the Midwest that have centers on women in philanthropy. Women tend to give for different reasons than men do. A lot of the times universities will approach it with, um, it's a competition, who's gonna give the biggest gift? Women wanna know the impact of their gifts. Yeah. Not so much, they don't like appeals that tend. So women alumni do give, but the one thing that is clear, and sorry guys, women really do inherit the earth um, because we live longer. And so um, a lot of schools are realizing they need to figure out how to reach out to women in particular because of the fact that they often end up holding the dollars um, on, on uh, underrepresented. They do give elsewhere. And there's a, there's a, literally there's books written on this. It's actually really a fascinating area. Yeah. On, other underrepresented populations, and again, I, I know different universities have to approach it different ways, but a lot of the times, those students didn't necessarily have the best experience on their mm -hmm. campus. And so when you think about how do you reach out to alumni 
given that their experiences may not have been the best, how do you sensitively reach out and try to bring them back into the university family is a whole other area that's really just starting to grow at different universities around the country. And, and in that, it's not so much we just want your money. It's we want to say, how do we bring you back into the family? Because maybe we didn't treat you like family when you were here. Um, let me circle back uh, with, with Rachel. Um, we, we talked a lot about sexual harassment early in the day. And since you are here from the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights, could you speak a little bit about what would be for you noncompliance in the sexual harassment context? And what would the institution have to do to come into compliance? And further, what would happen if they fail to come into compliance? I'm going to give a lawyer legal answer <laughs> to your first thing, that it's, it's difficult, I mean, to, to kind of say in the abstract what is noncompliance with sexual harassment. Obviously, under Title IX, you're required to, you know, adopt and publish grievance procedures providing for complaints of sex discrimination, including sexual harassment complaints, uh, have a designated Title IX coordinator. So those are some basic um, responsibilities, whether or not there are issues with sexual harassment on your campus that a university has to have. And certainly, if you don't have those going on on your campus, that's, autom that's you know a violation of Title IX. Now, in terms of how you handle those complaints, um, when you're uh, know or reasonably should have known about allegations of sexual harassment on your campus, um, you're required to investigate or otherwise determine what occurred. If you find that there was incidents of sexual harassment, they created a hostile environment, meaning it, it was a situation that was um, denying or limiting the uh, complainant or student's ability to benefit from your education program. You know, perhaps that individual wasn't able to go to class, wasn't able to take advantage of the library or extracurricular activities, things like that. That's what we're thinking about when we think about hostile environment. Um, if that did occur, then you're required to put um, take action to, first of all, end the sexual harassment, eliminate any hostile environment that exists, and then prevent its recurrence. So we're looking at when we're doing investigations in the sexual harassment context, we're looking at one, have you fulfilled those kind of administrative requirements? And two, what is the school's response when they're um, on notice of these allegations? How does the school respond? Um, and if, if your school is responding in a way that doesn't quite comply with Title IX, then we might um, you know, flag it for um, violations. When we do these kinds of reviews nowadays, though, they're much broader than that. We're looking at, um, you know, it's kind of class-wide. We're holding focus groups with, with students. We're trying to find out what's the environment on your campus kind of as a whole. We're looking at data for how did your school handle um, these types of incidents of which you were, you know, complaints that were filed at your institution for the last few years. We're kind of taking a broad look as in addition to, we're obviously looking at specific incidents that were reported to us as possible violations, but we're also kind of looking more broad. Now I will say, um, yes, it's true that um, if an institution fails to come into compliance with Title IX or with any of the other civil rights laws that OCR enforces, we do have the ability to terminate or suspend um, federal financial assistance that the department provides or refer the case to the Department of Justice to have kind of to get the court system involved. Um, this is something that we have done um, in, in the Title VI context. We mainly did it um, in relationship to desegregation cases um, back in the day, mainly at the K-12 level. We've done it in Title IX, most recently probably around 1992. Lots of those situations are situations where schools simply refuse to cooperate with OCR when we had the right to be there conducting an investigation or refuse to um, sign an assurance with the department that they're required to do and like you do with NASA, if you wanna get NASA funds, you have to sign assurances. So situations like that, we all have also done it in the 504 context as well. But legally, we're required to do a lot of steps before we actually terminate the funding. So we're statutorily required to seek voluntary compliance and that's why you'll see, um, and we post all of our agreements on our website and they're called voluntary resolution agreements. So after we've done our review, we are in negotiations with institutions or other entities that receive federal funds from us to put together these voluntary resolution agreements. And those, those negotiations can go on for a long time. It's only after we determine that there's an impasse in those negotiations that we will then 
you know, put the institution on notice that, hey, we think there's an impasse and we're not able to reach an agreement with you all. Um, and then there's, we say, if we don't get an agreement within 10 days, we're going to issue the letter of findings. There's no agreement within that 10 days and we issue the letter of findings. They're still, we're still trying to negotiate that resolution agreement for like another 30 days probably. And then at that point, if still nothing, we will then kind of move forward and issue a notice of impending enforcement action. And then at that point, we kind of start the process. But schools are always put on notice. There's an opportunity for hearing. There's an administrative law judge. And it's kind of, it's a big process, which is why you can see we haven't really done it recently in a number of years. We're typically able to secure voluntary compliance. So that's kind of the process that we go through. And all this is laid out. We have a case processing manual that's, you know, we're very transparent for how we process cases. And that's all on our website. So it's just, yes, it's true that if an institution refuses to come into compliance, we can do this. But there are a lot of things that have to happen before we would actually do that, even when we find institutions and that are in violation. NASA has similar, well, have mm -hmm. the same requirements as a, as a federal funding agency. But let me ask you, when we talk about um, a voluntary resolution agreement, and, and I'd like the other panelists to, to chime in here, what are the kinds of things that you're going to ask that institution to do to bring itself into compliance? What kinds of steps can they take to address the situation? In the, in the harassment context, it's typically um, They'll be making revisions to their policies and procedures to bring those into compliance. Um, we might have them, if we found issues with kind of the climate as a university, um, ask them to conduct climate surveys, which I know some folks in the STEM arena are doing that and kind of within their departments, but this would be kind of institution-wide as a whole. Um, we'll maybe require them to beef up their training for students, for faculty, for administrators, things like that. So, all of these and then anything that was specific to the incidents that were going on on their campus and we will then the periodic reports that were required that there will be required to submit to the, the office and we'll monitor their compliance with that resolution agreement and once we've determined that they have fully complied with everything they're um, responsible for doing and they were required to do in the agreement we will consider the case closed any questions from the audience virtual or uh yes Hi, Anna Park, uh, Great Minds in STEM. My question has to do with um, the recruiting and outreach across the board. With sequestration and the government shutdown, uh, we've seen great impact in Latino students and African American students wanting to pursue careers with the federal government because we lost a lot of momentum with the presence of your ERG groups and your scientists and engineers attending affinity conferences and participating on campus in a lot of activities that they used to do. About five years of impact um, across the board. And so as we're talking about new directions and what we have to do to be compliant for outreach and for recruitment, I would like to see and ask, is it possible that we can go back to supporting our ERG groups attending more campus events and more affinity group conferences, as was one of the recommendations, because it's in that informal setting in the hallways after the seminars where students particularly get to talk with you about issues that maybe they don't want to discuss in a seminar setting or on a panel discussion or at the career fair, et cetera, and the same on campus. So just want to see if we can maybe get back to that, because that was such a critical component that we saw. Are you talking about federal agency support or about educational institution support for the affinity groups, or both? Uh, about federal agencies, but also I know there's support of going to campus events also with campus recruiting or campus competitions as well as affinity group conferences. And we realized that there was an impact at that time and that it, it is, in fact, continuing. We do um, support a variety of professional conferences every year at NASA. I know our organization, Diversity and Equal Opportunity, supports, I believe we're supporting, if I'm not mistaken, Great Minds in STEM right now. Um, Laurel, did you have anything further to add on that point? I, I don't think directly, since I'm not in the agency community, but um, I would say that the affinity groups are one of the most powerful ways that faculty can reach students of color, the, the affinity conferences and mm -hmm. um, you know, doing some targeting recruitment at, at places like that. Mm -hmm. Getting back to this issue of the inclusive environment, Rachel touched on it a bit when she was talking about, well, what can an institution that maybe does have an environment that is hostile or, or at the very least is not conducive to uh, a welcoming um, 
sort of climate for everybody. What can NASA principal investigators do who are, as I think one of our earlier panelists said, the people on the ground? What can they do to make environments more inclusive? I mean, what kinds of strategic steps can they take? I'll throw sure. in one perspective on that. Um, is, again, we definitely benefited from our NASA compliance review. And the self-audit, Title IX self-audit we were doing that was in progress when they came on campus, um, we really hadn't focused, as I said, on some of the areas of financial aid and admissions and success, et cetera. Um, once we were forced to run those types of statistics, we found things that on the surface could appear to be significant disparities or differences in treatment between men and women. And this was surprising because, of course, you know, no one in the department had any discriminatory intent. And so in getting the data, we were able to dig in to these particular areas. And I recall one specifically, uh, one of the senior faculty members had historically only had male research assistants, you know, going back 10, 15, 20 years even, not one single female research assistant. And so, you know, we're, what, what's up with this? So we, we called him in and said, you know, why haven't you had any female graduate research assistants? And he said, well, I've never had any female students interested in my area of specialty. And then my question back is, well, what have you been doing to go out and find prospective graduate students, females, to bring them into your program to get them interested in your discipline? So there was no overt or covert discrimination, but forcing us to run the numbers uh, and again, not just when we're going to be audited, but you know, taking a couple of departments every year, just looking at the numbers was, was very eye-opening to us. And Title IX self-evaluation, which is really built into the regulations, is a critical component. That's uh, one of the reasons we, we had at our publication that we did several years ago about grantees conducting their own Title IX self-evaluations, because it's very much about what Joni is talking about, which is once you start looking at the numbers, you may find that there are some eye-opening circumstances going on, and you're, you're going to want to look more deeply. And that's something that you can certainly do. Certainly, you want to do it before a federal agency like NASA uh, comes to your doors. I think it's really important to involve your students throughout this process because they're the ones you know who are who are experiencing the environment who can give you tips you know for how do you really reach the students what are you you know in the harassment context sometimes we have schools who say oh everybody knows about our policies we put them in our you mm -hmm. know codes of conduct that we hand out every year in our handbook well then they do a survey and they find out nobody reads those <laughs> so you know you really need to reach out to your current students and see what are they experiencing and then it gets suggestions from them, involve them in your process for as you're considering um, what you're going to do to improve the climate. Mm -hmm. And I'll add one more thing we did in preparation for the uh, campus visit, and I wouldn't have told you this at the time, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, but a couple weeks before they came out, this was in January, as I recall, it was very cold January for Texas, um, but we had um, a couple of pizza lunches uh, where we invited all the undergraduate and graduate students in the department to come over lunch, have some pizza. We gave them this wonderful maroon, of course, Title IX t-shirt. And uh, I did a short presentation on Title IX. Our Dean of Students was there to explain from the student affairs point of view what they're doing on Title IX compliance. And we probably had 60 or 70 students just in those two sessions. You give them pizza and t-shirts, they're gonna come. <laughs> So that was one way uh, that we addressed also heightening uh, the level of visibility of Title IX and the university's commitment to compliance. Well, and what can Title IX coordinators do to interface more directly with their, science, their STEM departments to let them know about the requirements of Title IX? It, it all depends. And I can <laughs> say that from my perspective on the Association of Title IX Administrators um, Advisory Board. Uh, Title IX, obviously, since the April 2011 Dear Colleague letter has just, you know, increased in visibility on a daily basis. Uh, I think uh, if we look nationally, our institutions of higher education are slowly getting up to speed where they should have been four or five years ago as far as staffing, as far as, uh, again, self-assessments, as far as trainings for faculty, staff, and students. And so it really depends on uh, who your Title IX coordinator is and whether he or she has other duties as assigned. Uh, it's only in the last couple of years that full-time Title IX administ uh, 
co coordinators have been established, uh, even at some of the main campuses. Uh, we were a little bit ahead of the curve because, as you know, uh, I'm at the A&M system level, and I've always coordinated Title IX across the system in addition to the other civil rights compliance. So we kind of had a macro view uh, when the Dear Colleague letter hit. But if, if to me, you, your Title IX function needs to be um, positioned well in the organization with a direct line to the president or CEO or some other senior official, it needs to be well staffed because if you're gonna oversee investigations as well as general compliance issues, you're gonna need a team of trained investigators, particularly those who have trauma-informed training to deal with sexual violence issues. And then you need to, get it to be well-resourced to be able to carry out a lot of training programs, or at least be able to coordinate and, and assemble a, a listing of what those training programs are so that no particular uh, group is left out. And so, for example, international students, you know, whatever training, diversity training or Title IX training you're going to give to your international students may look somewhat different than what you would do for just your general incoming freshman class. So I, I say it's dependent because it really depends on the institution's commitment to, uh, you know, to properly staff and resource the Title IX function. Mm -hmm. you have a question? Karen? Um, with Portland State University, and I've had the pleasure of just having a compliance review. I just wanted to point out a couple things that we were even doing before we had the review. One was um, I was making sure I presented in the Women in STEM program and other women groups um, so that individuals could know um, who your Title IX coordinator, what resources are on campus, and how to be able to talk to somebody in a private way without having to go through either faculty or PIs um, and being able to have that ability. We have confidential advocates on our campus, so I let them know that they have the option of talking to somebody confidentially. Um, and that applies not just to students who are involved in student-to-student -student sexual assault. Our advocates also give resources to our students who experience some form of sexual harassment by a faculty member. Um, and I do have to say, since we've had our audit, um, I have had more of a presence at our orientation. Um, I now have gone for our summer orientations that take place over the summer. We would have one day orientations, and I think I have presented at over 20 orientations now. Um, so every incoming student, whether it's a transfer student or a freshman, um, now has a face to their Title IX coordinator as well as one of our advocates. We have a one-page document that they, we have them pull out to see um, what the resources are that's separate from their student handbook. But we also have an online module that, um, we that are required for students to take and they're informed of that so they can get that information before they come on campus. So the take from that, as I wanted to say, is the more presence you have and um, like I present at the graduate teaching assistance orientation and all of our mentor orientations. And I think the more presence you have as um, not just your Title IX coordinator, but um, the people who work in the resources, the, the better your students will be informed on how to get the assistance that they need. Right, and as a federal grant awarding agency, NASA has responsibilities to look into compliance, which is why we've been conducting the reviews. And what we found very interesting is that sometimes there isn't a lot of connection or connectivity between the Title IX coordinator's office and the STEM department. So, you know, it's almost as if they're not even aware of that they're on the same campus. So one of the things that I think we've been able to do is to bring together various campus elements so that they can see that there is a lot of connectivity between what the Title IX compliance coordinator is doing and what the experiences of the individuals in your STEM department are. I'd like to bring Christine back into the conversation because I know we've been talking a lot about the gender equity issue in, in education. Can you speak a little bit more toward uh, about other, uh, in, well, the disability issue, but are there any issues of equity and accessibility that you would like to touch on in the, in the science museum context that you haven't touched on before? It's actually been really interesting to follow this conversation to, and to see the challenges that universities are thinking about. I actually think that we're thinking of the challenges in a very different way. So starting with gender equity, what's really interesting is that 59% of the adults who come to the Museum of Science are female. Mm. Um, and because it's often the female caregiver that's bringing their child. Um, and we have, um, 
is about the same as our general population, 46% of um, the children who come are female. Mm. And so we don't have a problem in terms of attracting the audience. Um, but what we do have a, a difficulty with, um, and we're always striving for, is making sure that people feel equally included. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we're thinking about it, whether it's people with disabilities or women um, or people of color, what we're always thinking about is um, not just the STEM pipeline, which is a lot of what we're talking about today, mm -hmm. but how do we make sure that everyone sees themselves as a STEM learner so they can participate in society as an informed STEM citizen? And I think that that often gets lost when we're thinking about the work of the universities. But for us, that's something that's always in our mind. So the, the moms who are coming, do they start to see themselves as someone who can learn about STEM and support their child's STEM learning, as someone who can then vote um, in elections, as someone who can participate in their local government and be informed STEM learners. Um, with people with disabilities, what's really interesting is um, more, I find, overt um, because they're less informed, discrimination by assuming um, lesser ability than the people have. Mm. Um, and so when um, some of the studies I've done with museums, um, they assume um, they have to do a lot more accommodations for people with disabilities than they assume lesser abilities than they actually have. Mm -hmm. uh, because they're just not informed about the capabilities of people with disabilities. Um, and so as a result, um, you know, I've heard things like people who are blind can't use computers. Well, I know someone who's a PhD scientist um, who's a computer scientist, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot out there. It's just that we don't design museum and computers to be accessible for people who are blind. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there's a lot more overt discrimination in that area that we mm -hmm. need to be thinking about. Um, and so I think there's a lot that universities could be doing to learn more about the capabilities of people with disabilities and what they can contribute and about the barriers um, that are in place that, that create um, an equal opportunity. Jill, to see if there's anybody virtual? Okay. okay. You've talked a lot about individual families, uh, mothers, um, children, people coming. What about school groups? What are you doing with regard to school groups that come uh, with um, a, a broad diversity of students and to uh, help them feel like they belong there? I'm so glad you asked that question. At the Museum of Science, actually 80% of our audience is not part of a school group. So the bulk of our audience um, are families. So we think about our, our groups in a different way. Um, we actually see more um, racial and ethnic diversity in our school groups than we do in our public audience. So it's a great example. Um, and so thinking about um, the opportunities that we can afford children who are coming who are, as part of a school group, who may not come later as part of a family group. Um, we have a wonderful program. Every second grader in the city of Boston comes to the Museum of Science, um, at least once during the school year. And when they come, they're given a um, mentor that walks around the building and it's kind of a paired mentorship of an older adult volunteer and um, a high school student that's from one of our more diverse high schools in the Boston area. Um, and so they um, kind of experience the museum in kind of a small group setting that's similar to a family setting which we think goes a long way. Um, we once tried to um, take that program in particular and make a bridge between the school group visit and the family group visit. Um, and we gave the children free passes to come back to the museum with their family. And um, I forget what percentage was used, but it was in the single digits. And the big barrier um, that we have is that parents, it's not the free admission. We're giving them free admission. It was parents um, who were afraid to look uninformed in front of their children. So if they didn't feel like they had a STEM affinity, they didn't want to come and have their children ask questions that they couldn't answer. Um, so that's a big barrier for us, and we think that that's our next greatest challenge that we really need to tackle as an organization, and it's something we're going to begin in earnest coming this fall. Thank you, Christine. 
Well, everybody, I, I hope that we have given you during this panel and during the discussion some real world ways uh, in which compliance takes place. I hope we've shown you that compliance is really just about combating barriers, whether it's fighting stereotypes, whether it is addressing uh, conduct that is inappropriate. Uh, being in compliance with the civil rights laws when you're a federal entity that's receiving federal dollars is really just about taking strategic actions like the, one, the many actions that I think you've heard about during this panel panel and taking those actions with an eye toward being a more inclusive environment. So I'd, I'd like uh, everybody to help me out to thank our panelists again. And now I think we're going to be able to take just a very short break before we head into our final, our final session.